Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to be diving into the language side of cognition and language, looking at how we learn language and how does language influence the way that we think. So let's go ahead and get started. Today we're going to start by looking at the basic structures of language and how we learn them as we grow. So the basic structures of language include phonemes and morphemes. Phonemes are the smallest units of sound in a language. They are essentially the building blocks of language, the way that we pronounce different sounds within a language. It's very difficult to get these pronunciations correct unless they were present at a young age. Generally speaking, why adults learning a new language often speak with an accent. So to think about what phonemes are, think about the word dog. There are three phonemes in there, the d, a, and g, make up the three distinct sounds that we use to create that word. So phonemes are the smallest units of sound that we have. Morphemes, on the other hand, are the smallest units that have meaning. So these could be a whole word or a part of a word. So they could be things like ed at the end of a word to indicate past tense or ing to indicate something taking place right now. Or it could be an entire word if it's small enough, like the word dog. That is the smallest unit in the word that could have meaning. It means to us the animal that is a dog. So these are the first steps to establishing language. From there, we have to put these words and parts of words into the correct order. And that is done using, of course, grammar. And so grammar are the set of rules that we have to follow in a language that makes communicating with each other easier. If we all follow the same grammatical rules, it's much easier for us to understand what another person is trying to communicate. One part of grammar that we need to follow is known as semantics, which if you remember from our memory unit is what words mean and what things mean. And so this incorporates specific words or again, those morphemes, parts of words. If you know the difference between walked, as in past tense, and walking, as in present tense, that is because you understand the semantics of those words, the meaning of them. And if you can tell the difference between the word walk and run, again, that is semantics. So the word choice that we use and the past and present tense that we use all help us to convey the messages we're trying to communicate. The other thing that we can communicate in language is syntax, and that is the rule about the order of words. In English, for example, we would say something like, I fell down, not down fell I, <laughs> unless we're trying to speak like Yoda, but different languages have different rules about the order of words, where in Spanish they might say, pero grande, we don't say dog big, we say big dog. So that is going to vary from language to language, the semantics and syntax of the language that we're using. But together this helps us to build the language that we use to communicate with others so hopefully they can understand us. And of course in the brain we see this taking place in our Wernicke's area where we understand that speech and our Broca's area where we produce that speech. And so as we are developing and growing, these brain parts are developing along with us to help us to be able to create words in the language that we speak. And so as babies develop starting around four months, that is where we start to see the beginning of their language development. During this first stage, known as the babbling stage, what babies are actually doing is they are starting to understand the language that is being used around them and producing these phonemes, those babbles of goo goo, la la, are actually them trying to create the sounds that are going to be used in their language. By about 10 months, this babbling language is going to start to resemble more household language. And by right around one year is where they reach what's known as the one word stage, where they can start saying single words like ba or bottle or mama or dada they're starting to be able to create full words to communicate with others. By the time they reach about the 24 month or two year stage, that is where they reach 
the two-word stage, also known as telegraphic speech, conveying very simple messages like want nama for I want banana or go sleep, I want to go to sleep. You can see already these sentences are following the correct syntax rules, right? They're not saying sleep go, they'll say go sleep. And from this point on, they start to form sentences very rapidly. We do see some mistakes taking place at this age, a concept known as overgeneralization. So as they start to learn some rules, like using ED for past tense, they might start to apply that to all past tense. So it's like saying, I petted the dog instead of I pet the dog, because they're taking what they've learned about things happening in the past, and they learn to apply it to all words in their language. And so this gives us a little bit of insight into how we develop language. The other part that we have to look at is the nature versus nurture debate in why we develop language. Is it because we are reinforced to learn language by our environment and our parents? Or is language deep inside of our brain that we just need to turn it on in order to express the language that we already have? So this is where the debate lies. If you remember from our learning unit, B.F. Skinner believes in learning through imitation, association, and reinforcement. And so he believed that language came as a result of reinforcement. That when these babies make these sounds, they get smiles and cheers from their parents. It tells them that this is good and they need to keep doing it. And as they start to mimic what their parents say and repeat words back, that that is how they learn language. On the other side of the argument is Noam Chomsky, and Chomsky felt that we actually have inborn universal language, that children learn words way too fast, that it cannot solely be from the learning perspective, and that they're not always just mimicking or repeating things back, but that they can create sentences that they have never heard before. And so there must be some type of internal language acquisition device, as he called it, that exists in our minds that we just need exposure to language to be turned on in order to start expressing the language that we speak. Chomsky felt that the proof that we have this language acquisition device is because of all languages having similar building blocks, which he called this universal grammar. And that as we start to be exposed to our language, the learning acquisition device is turned on for what we call the surface structure of language and we can create meaning out of those words using deep structure. To give you an example of what the difference between deep structure and surface structure is, consider the sentence, Nancy watched the ball. The surface structure of that sentence is the actual grammar and syntax that is turned on in our language acquisition device. So that is what we have inside of us that is turned on by exposure to our environment. Nancy watch the ball is a grammatically correct sentence and we can see what is taking place. The deep structure is the actual meaning behind that sentence because that sentence actually has two or more meaning, right? Is Nancy watching the ball like she is a baseball player watching a ball or is Nancy watching the ball means she's watching people dancing at a ball. So that is the deep structure of the sentence knowing what that sentence means that we can derive meaning from. And so some of Chomsky's support for his theory include the critical period hypothesis. If you remember learning about Jeannie, she was not exposed to a language in the first 13 years of her life and was never able to fully master a language. Chomsky said that the optimal period for learning that first language had to be until about the age of seven or the window closes and it becomes more difficult to learn a language. And this is true for second languages as well. The younger we are, the more readily we are able to learn a second language because our brain is able to take in this information. And the younger that we are, the more readily we are able to learn a second language as well. So it seems to apply to both first and second languages. It's not impossible to learn a second language as we age. It just becomes more difficult. And again, the phonemes are more challenging. And so we might speak with an accent. So when it comes to the nature versus nurture debate, chances are it's probably a little bit of both that lead us to developing our language. But when it comes to cognition and language, what comes first, the cognition or the language? Benjamin Lee Worf posited that language determines the way that we think, and he called this linguistic determinism, that without language, we would not be able to speak, 
and different languages influence the way that we think in different ways. And this is known as the linguistic relativity hypothesis. Essentially, the idea is the word order and word choice can affect our thinking because different languages have different words in it that can change the way a person thinks. The indigenous tribe of the Hopi, for example, have no past tense, and so it is more difficult in that language to think about the past. English has a lot of words for self-focused emotions, so we can think very often about how we feel. And Japanese has a lot of words for interpersonal emotions, so thinking about others seems to come more easily. And those that speak multiple languages, studies have found that they will end up with different personality test results depending on which language they take the test in. So the way that the words are presented in that language seem to have an influence on how they think about the question and answer it. So language clearly has some influence on thought. And there seems to be even a bilingual advantage to speaking multiple languages because it can actually enhance thought or help people think about things in a different way than they would be able to in only one language. The final question for today is can animals use language and can they use human language? Research with apes learning sign language or pointing to signs show us that they can form concepts, they can use insight or those aha moments in their cognition. They can use and create tools. They can transmit cultural innovations. They have theory of mind. They can recognize themselves and they can think about how other people are thinking and feeling and express empathy. But do they actually use language? We've seen many studies where they develop vocabulary, push buttons to transmit thoughts, use signs and symbols such as Coco the gorilla and Washo and Kanzi the chimps. All of these are examples of animals using language to express themselves. And it appears that yes, animals can transmit information and feelings, but it seems that only humans can truly master verbal or signed expression of complex grammar and rules of syntax. So it's kind of like us trying to understand how other animals communicate to each other how dolphins or bees communicate. We might understand it, but we might not be able to understand it fully enough to actually envelop ourselves in it and utilize it as effectively as the original species would be able to. So that's where we're gonna go ahead and stop for today on cognition and language and how cognition influences language. Up next, we'll move on to different types of intelligence and how do we test for it. Thank you so much for watching and remember, be kind to your mind.